Hi, uh, welcome to this evening's uh, Chicago Humanities Festival event um, with um, Salman Rushdie uh, to celebrate the publication of his uh, book of essays, uh, Languages of Truth, uh, Essays 2003 to 2020. Uh, my name is Srikanth Reddy, uh, and um, I'll uh, skip the um, niceties of uh, biographical uh, introductions because um, Salman uh, doesn't need any introduction. Um, and uh, say that a live captioning for this evening's event uh, will be provided. Uh, and uh, if you need to activate that, uh, you can do that on YouTube. So, um, it's my honor to welcome Salman Rushdie to this evening's um, event. And let me see if I can get my speaker um, view on here and uh, say to Salman, you know, it's such an honor and uh, pleasure to, um, to speak with you uh, after reading your work over all these years and really um, kind of daunting to try and um, figure out a way of beginning to talk about this uh, mm -hmm. book of um, this book of essays uh, that gather your thinking over the last 20 years. Uh, so I thought I'd kind of maybe start at the beginning um, uh, or actually rather at the ending. Uh, and um, w the book ends with an essay about lockdown under COVID and imagining what the world might look like on the other side of that rabbit hole. And um, you talk about what you've been reading and, and watching during that time. And it occurred to me that that kind of space of lockdown uh, feels a lot like um, what you what you discuss in the beginning of the book, which is the um, the kind of storytelling uh, appetite that human beings have, uh, yeah. and uh, in particular Shahrazad. And I think after a kind of long year of all of us feeling a little bit like we're in uh, a thousand one nights, uh, you know, except YouTube is our or our, you know, Netflix is our. Shahrazad, you know, feeding us stories. I'd love to just hear you um, talk about what it meant to be like a writer uh, under these circumstances, and what you know, what was Salman Rushdie writing and thinking and trying to do creatively during this time. Well, you know, for, for, first of all, hello, and very nice to be with, with you, um, Srikanth, and with everybody out there. Thank you for watching. Um, you know, for for the longest time uh, after the pandemic hit, I really wasn't much of a writer. I was more of a reader and an audience. You know, uh, I think like many people, I felt, I felt kind of overwhelmed by events. I thought that, I thought the, uh, you know, the avalanche of horror was, was, was so great that it was very hard to find the, the creative space to, to do to do new writing and and um, and actually I did try a little bit and I I began two different projects both of which I rapidly came to or not rapidly I slowly came to understand were were, were terrible 
and and had to set them aside. So I had a kind of number of creatively fallow months, really. And, and can you tell us what those uh, failed projects uh, are? No, I think I'm not going to tell you. What <laughs> I mean, they were both they were both attempts at at some kind of long form fiction, but uh, but they didn't they didn't gel, you know. And and I think it's because I found it difficult to focus properly, you know. And uh, so what I did do was to watch gigantic amount of movies. I mean, not so much. I know everybody has been watching TV series and so on, you know, but. Um, I, I, and I did my share of that, but, but I decided to go back to the world of the movies that I had first discovered as a young person at university, the, 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 the films, the art films, if you like, of the, uh, you know, the French New Wave and the Italian New Wave and, and, and the, the, the art cinema of the 60s, of the 50s and 60s and 70s, you know, and, and just to, remind myself of these movies that I, in many cases, hadn't seen in, in decades, you know, films like La Dolce Vita um, or, um, you know, Buñuel's Exterminating Angel or, uh, you know, the films of the great filmmakers of that time, the, the Godard and Truffaut, and, and it was interesting to see what stood up and what didn't. You know, there, there, there were some films, I mean, for example, I've always been a huge admirer of the films of Michelangelo Antonioni. And, and I was watching his famous trilogy and I thought that both the first two films, La Ventura and La Notte stood up beautifully. And then I was watching the third film, Le Clisse, and and suddenly there on the screen was this appalling scene of Monica Vitti in blackface. <laughs> I thought, you know, Maybe not. <laughs> maybe, maybe after all these years, uh, not. So I, that's one film I failed to finish. But no, it was wonderful to get give myself that refresher course in the cinema. And and then in the middle of the year, I did a, I think, completely goofy thing, which is at the moment when every theater in the world was shut, I wrote my first play. Uh, at the time, it was impossible to have a play put on. Um, so there's that, I finished that, and now we're beginning to have conversations about, about what might happen with it. Um, so hopefully, I mean, I, I have a suspicion that it won't, it won't be anywhere, won't be seen anywhere this year. And, and I think that's okay, actually. I mean, I think I'd in a way sooner wait for next year and for people to feel more comfortable to be going back to the theater. Um, so. So that's a, um, kind of, um, audaciously um, kind of hopeful thing to do uh, in the midst of a global pandemic. Uh, what, what, why did you, what I, brought I, you to think about writing for theater when, at this I, time? Look, when I, when I've always wondered why I haven't done it before, because when I was younger, when I was at university and even after that, I was very involved in, uh, in student theater and, 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 and after university in the then very active Fringe Theatre in London, um, and and yet I never wrote for the stage. And and I think it's because there was a part of me that just likes the business of doing it by yourself, you know, of sitting in a room and making something. Um, yeah. But I've always had, you know, a, a love of theatre, and and, um, and it finally showed up, you know, it finally at, at, at this at this advanced age. Um, <laughs> I, I found myself writing, and, and not only that, but it's a kind of new Greek tragedy, uh, and it's about Helen of Troy, and it's entirely written in verse. <laughs> What's so great? It, it's sort of a completely zany thing to do, <laughs> and um, and we'll see. I mean, that you know, people. That, I mean, I've been talking to producers and directors and, and people seem to like it. So one of the difficulties now is that because of COVID, theatres are, first of all, theatres aren't properly open yet. And, and, and um, it's not clear exactly when they will be able to properly open. And many theatres are, well, first of all, they're very financially hard up. And, and, and secondly, that many of them have commissioned works. They have a backlog of, of already commissioned works. You know? So 
So I guess I have to take my place in the line. So uh, <laughs> you're so, right about. Yeah, please, please go ahead. No, no, that's it. So I mean, I'm hoping that maybe by this time next year, you know, it'll it'll find its way onto a stage. That's. Uh, I mean, you talk about um, your um, kind of checkered history in the theater as an undergraduate. Uh, uh, back in the day uh, in the book, in the book of essays. Um, but it's uh, fascinating to hear that you're interested in theater and live performance now at a time when it seems so very far away from us. Well, it's just an act of optimism, you know, that, yeah. that, that the world will return. Um, and why, why Helen? Why, you know, I mean, well, well, that's exactly. very why, well because you know, I've been very interested in, in the Greeks for a long time and in this, you know, the worst of all families, the house of Atreus, <laughs> the most unpleasant in-laws you could have, you know, yeah. even worse than the house of Windsor, you know, it's, uh, and, and it struck me that this character, of Helen, who um, tries to escape from the house of Atreus, tries to run away from her husband Menelaus. All we know about her really um, is is two things. We know that she's beautiful, and we know that uh, that she her escape launches a, a ten year war. But beyond that, the, the the canon that exists tells us almost nothing about her. You know what? I mean, what is she like? Who is she? You know. Um, what does she, why does she do what she does? What does she feel about the consequences of what she does? Um, what motivates her, you know, who is this person? And it, it, it struck me that very interesting to have an extremely famous name. You know, everybody, almost everybody knows who you're talking about when you say Helen of Troy. But it's a kind of empty space. There's a sort of hole there, you know, and and so I thought, well, that's tempting. That it's tempting to try and fill the hole, you know. Um, and so that's that's how it started. Well, that actually um, resonates with the things that were on my mind as I was reading your uh, book. Um, I mean, in fact, all of your books, <laughs> but but your uh, you know, I mean, Enchantress of Florence is kind of imagining uh, mm. a, a life that never got told yes. Um, yes. and uh, in many ways the the essays are interested in these this question of um, like lost stories mm. right? um, whether it's uh, the the lost source of the Arabian Nights mm -hmm. Right or uh, the possible meeting of um, Shakespeare and Cervantes, yes. or of um, uh, your own like first uh, book, uh, which I loved the little anecdote about you'd written a, a, a story about the wizard based on the Wizard of Oz. That was your first uh, story fiction, right? Or, yes. Yeah. Yes. So lost stories in a way, right? Yes. It seems like it animates your work from. Well, it's it's interesting you say that because. On the one hand, there are stories that don't get told mm. for all sorts of reasons, some of which are power reasons, who gets to tell the story, yeah, yeah. you know, um, and, and I've always been interested in that, that, um, you know, as somebody not in origin from the first world, you know, I mean, I, it, it's, uh, it's interesting and important for me to tell the stories that might otherwise not get told, you know, um, and, uh, uh, and then there are stories that just fall through the cracks, you know, that, that there are people who somehow never have their story told. And, 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 uh, and if I can find a way of telling some of those stories, then, then that's, then that's, then that's good. Um, I do think that the, the storehouse of narrative that I was as a way gifted by being born and brought up in India, uh, has been just invaluable to me because, uh, and these are, these are stories which, if they're known at all in the West, they're thought of as children's stories. You know, um, Sinbad the Sailor, Aladdin and the Wonderful Lamp, 
Alibaba and the 40 Thieves. In their original, they're not children's stories at all. Uh, uh, th these are stories with very profound philosophical, mystical elements, you know, and certainly are not written in children's language. You know, they're, they're written in very adult language. And yet I, like everybody else, first experienced them as a child. I mean, I think my first experience of these stories was in the versions told to me by my parents as bedtime stories. Um, and, and I just thought it was wonderful to hear these extraordinary tales. You know, we, they seemed to make the world more interesting. You know, and, and, um, and it gave me a great belief in the fictiveness of fiction. You know, that, that stories are not true. That's, that's one of the great lessons of, of, the, of the wonder tales of the East. They are not true. Somebody made them up. And once you allow yourself to accept that fact, it sets you free. And, I, and uh, it sets you free to, to dream up stuff. And, and so that's, uh, that's one of the reasons for, why, for collecting these essays, because, because several of them, in, in particular the, in the first part of the book, um, deal with this question of what is story and why does it matter so much to us? You know, and, and, um, and why are we these creatures who, who, who are narrative? You know, why are we storytelling animals? Yeah, I love how, um, you know, in a way I read the book as a kind of defense of story or as a kind of polemic in some ways uh, for the imagination um, and, and, and the plur plural nature of uh, the languages of truth. Um, and, you know, one, um, one aspect of that uh, was a kind of defense of um, falsehood in a way. Uh, you know, I, one moment I remember in the book was when you uh, cite the Arabic version of one, it, Once Upon a Time, mm. uh, which is like, it was so, it was not so. Or is exactly, that... yes, it was so, it was not so. That's, that's how they begin, uh -huh. Khan Makan. Right. The thing can be simultaneously so and not so. And that seems like that's the ba in one way it's a kind of caption for the book uh, because it, you know, yeah yeah I yeah. mean this is the question you know of, of one gets asked in this time which is a time so full of lies you know um, uh, one gets asked you know why are you making stuff up when there's already so many people making stuff up um, and and um, aren't you just making things worse. Um, <laughs> And I mean, my answer to it is that in some ways, fiction and lies, although they appear to be on the same side of the column are actually on opposite sides because, because the purpose of literature, the, as in the purpose of all art really, is to move towards the truth, you know, by, 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 by whatever means. Um, the purpose of literature is to, is to tell some kind of truth about human beings and human lives and who we are and why we are like that and what we do to each other and, and, and so on. Um, so whether these are naturalistic fictions or fabulous fictions, their purpose is to tell some kind of truth. You know, whereas, whereas the lie is, is, a, is, a, is a means of obscuring the truth. You know, so, that, so that although they may be superficially alike, they're actually in many ways opposite. So I, that in some ways I think gets to the... Um, question I was going to ask about the title of the book, um, is languages of truth, why where plural? languages is plural. Yeah, why right. plural? Well, because I think what I was trying to get at was that there are, there are, many, there are many roads to the truth. You know, uh, I, you could argue that journalism is one way, you know, um, poetry is another way. Um, all the different arts, music, is a way to a certain kind of truth which doesn't even need language. And the, one of the examples that this I gave somewhere in the book is that if you, if you look at Van Gogh's painting of a starry night it, okay. and then look out at the sky at a starry night, they don't look the same. And yet it's a very good painting of a starry night, which, which says a lot about the nature of a starry night. 
So I guess that's what I'm saying, that there are, there are, there are these ways of telling the truth. Uh, the, there are many languages. There are languages which are visual, languages which are verbal, languages which are musical, you know. Um, and and I, in this book, I mean, there's a lot of consideration of, of visual arts as well, you know. Um, and so I wanted to say that, yeah, these are, these are all languages, so to speak, through which the truth can be arrived at. You anticipated my next question, which was about um, languages that we might not think of as languages, right? Uh, it's, the essays are so visual uh, and so um, deeply kind of invested in visual experience, um, including, um, you know, visual artists who I am embarrassed as a, you know, writer of South Asian descent not to have known about. Um, you know, um, Amrita Shergill, I'd never heard of before. I'm just going to display my ignorance. Okay, here. all right, you're forgiven. Uh, but but uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, the importance of visual art, including film, uh, in your work. Um, there's a beautiful essay about the Hamza Nama. Uh, uh, yes. Well, the Hamza Nama is a, a, a you know is a, is a collection of I mean well not that many survive but originally thousands of images created during the reign of the emperor the Mughal emperor Akbar in his art atelier um, and it's remarkable because what he did was to to gather together artists from all over India artists working in very different manners very different styles and to get them to collaborate on canvases. So, so there's there are no canvases in the Hamza Nama made by a single artist. You know, they're they're, um, they're all made, you have you know one artist doing figures, another doing backgrounds, a third doing the clouds, and so on. And, and it's a tiny tiny canvases, right? So they're not, not absolutely tiny. No, the, the, the Hamza Nama canvases are about well, they're actually on cloth, um, but they're, they're about um, I don't know about you know they're about three feet high by about by about 18 inches across, sort of like that size. Uh, and they would be shown almost like movies, you know, when they were being displayed, people would hold up these canvases and often on the reverse of the canvas, of, of the cloth, there would be a, a narrative which, which explained the story of the image. So, so it was like going to the movies. Um, and what he showed or what the art studio of the emperor showed was that's what should be a mess when you have three or four artists collaborating on a single canvas, actually made something transcendent, you know, and, and, um, and it was very important to me, th that idea. I mean, it happens sometimes in Western art, you know, in the, there are, there, there are canvases, for example, on which uh, Basquiat and Julian Schnabel and Francesco Clemente all, all collaborated uh, and maybe also Andy Warhol. Um, so, there are moments in Western art in which that's happened, but they're they're relatively rare, you know. And and uh, this idea of a kind of composite artist, you know, an artist which represents the whole culture by being many-headed, by being literally three or four people, was very attractive to me. And and you know, when I was young, I remember in there was a moment in in London when there was a gathering of a group of artists, painters who had come from India. Uh, and who had expressed a desire to meet um, writers, artists of Indian origin living in London. You know, so we had this kind of get together, and and many of those artists became my good friends, and um, and I began to really closely follow what was happening in in the arts in India. And it has been, I mean, for example, when I wrote, you mentioned Amrita Shergill, when when I wrote the Moors Last Sai, where there's a woman painter who is at the centre of that. Had it not been for the existence of Amrita Shergill, I wouldn't have known how to invent that character. You know? and, and had it not been for my close association with a number of, of contemporary Indian artists, I would have felt very scared to write a book w which is set in the world of, of contemporary Indian art. You know? so, so I've always been very interested in the visual arts. And, 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 uh, and so, yeah, there's a bunch of artists, not all of them Indian. There's a piece about Francesco Clemente. There's a piece about Kara Walker. Um, and 
and and the movies. You know, the movies I've always thought have been as important to me as books, in 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 shaping the way that I've learned to imagine. You know, um, so so yeah, I think one of the things one of the things I've learned in life is that the the things people like your about your books, if they like your books, are exactly the things that people who don't like your books don't like. <laughs> <laughs> So, so people who like so they books, like you, yeah. What people they who like? like my books often say they're very visual, and they say that oh, as yeah. praise. Yeah. People who don't like my books say they're very visual, and they say that not as praise. You know, so it's I guess a question of what you want from a book. Interesting to know that there's so many anti-visual readers out there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, one of the so a full quarter of the book is about visual arts yeah. and um, and and as you say, not only uh, Indian artists but uh, you know uh, artists working in the U.S. like Taryn si Simon, who I'd never heard of before. Well, you 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 will hear about her a lot because she's becoming a colossal star. But yeah. I, mean, I I met her when she was very young, and and she rather. I mean, we met. Uh, we have mutual friends, and and, and um, she rather kind of shyly asked if I would look at some of her work, and mm -hmm. and I looked at it, and I just thought this work is astonishing. And this was a a, a, a show she had uh, at at the Gagosia Gallery, uh, and, and which then became a book called a hidden and hid, an, in, an American Index of the Hidden and Unfamiliar. And apart from anything else, I thought this girl, this woman is one of the most persuasive human beings I've ever come across. She was able to get leaders of the Ku Klux Klan to pose with their hoods off. Yeah. Um, she was allowed to photograph inside Langley at, in the headquarters of the CIA. Um, I thought, nobody can stop this woman. You know? <laughs> um, and so I wrote, it, I wrote that essay. The essay that's in the book was written in response to that exhibition. Uh, so is there something about that kind of um, undercover uh, kind of, you know, um, art making where you kind of access kind of hidden realities um, that speaks to you in your own writing? Or? Well, I like, I like the idea that the world is not obvious, you know, yeah. that, 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 that what we see on the surface may not be the reality. You know, um, and um, and sometimes you have to dig a little, you know, to get to get under the surface um, to find to find the truth. And um, especially now nowadays, I feel when there's so much obfuscation, there are so many people throwing up smoke screens, you know, uh, 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 or to put it more simply, lying to us. That that in order to find out what's really going on, you sometimes have to have to dig. I mean, in the most simple contemporary example, the figures that we're getting from India about the about the calamity of the pandemic there. Uh, I mean, even sources like the New York Times are willing to say that that the real figures may be ten times that size. So. So there, there's a, 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 a simple example of where the kind of officially offered truth is, is ludicrously separate from the actual facts. Um, and I think that's, that's something that's happened a lot in, in, in human history, that, that the official version is, is a fiction. You know, and, and paradoxically, fiction writers, by getting away from the official version, uh, find find a way of, of telling some truth. That's uh, so. I'd love to talk more about India, um, and uh, maybe I'll, I'll pause though briefly to invite. Um, I forgot to uh, uh, say at the beginning of this um, event that we really welcome questions from the audience. So we'll have um, we're retaining about fifteen minutes at the end of this hour for questions from the audience. So please do submit your questions if you like. Uh, but um, that whole question of kind of like the black box of what um, uh, 
reality is like in India today, for example. Um, uh, what is your, uh, how are you able to kind of um, stay abreast and over, over the past year being so far away? Uh, yeah. Well, it's, you know, it's difficult. There's a, there's a lot of us, um, as we're called, non-resident Indians, <laughs> NRIs. Right. I mean, you too, you too. Exactly. Um, um, who get back when we can and, and try and stay in touch as much as we can. I mean, I have, you know, I have a, I have a lot of friends all over the country and, and I've actually spent a lot of time in recent weeks uh, talking to people in India to get some sense of what's going on, you know, and, um, and, it's, and it's horrific. I talked to a friend of mine last week who said that she had been trying to get a vaccine and she had gone on, tried to get on the government website and the government website kept crashing. And then when she did get in, she was told that there would be no vaccine available for at least a month and a half. You know, uh, <laughs> meanwhile, the administration or some members of the administration anyway, are stating that the problem is to do with vaccine hesitancy. You know, but this isn't vaccine hesitancy. There's no vaccine to hesitate about. You know? And right. so, so, you know, you try and stay in touch by staying in touch with people. So that's that, I mean, I, I do my share of reading and, and try and keep abreast. But of course, it's, it's hard. There's no, there's no substitute for on the ground firsthand experience. And, and I'm, I'm very aware of that. And, you know, mm. unfortunately, it doesn't look like any of us can get over there anytime soon with any degree of safety. Yeah. So how do you um, kind of balance that um, political urgencies on the ground in India? And I mean, you've been outspoken about um, uh, political situation globally, uh, you know, with your work at Penn. Uh, how do you kind of square that with your uh, literary work as a novelist? I, you're teaching, you know, uh, in the journalism program, right? Yeah, yeah. I like journalism students. Yeah. Journalism students have one foot in the real world, you know, <laughs> and and uh, and they're they're enjoyable to teach because of that. Uh, I had a I had a young man from Sri Lanka in my in my class a few years ago, who whose idea of a summer vacation was to go to the border between Turkey and ISIS and stand on it. You know, and I said, really, that's what you did on your summer holiday? And why would you do that? He said, I wanted to see it. And I thought, well, these are interesting people. <laughs> uh, and and I, one of the reasons I, I do it is because I think I've always felt that there's an overlap between the best literature and reportage. Uh, in that, to, in my view, you need to get beyond what is given to you by your own life. You need to go and find more things out. And, and I always feel when I write a book that I'd like by the time I finish a book to know something I didn't know when I started work on the book. You know, so it, it, it seems to me that writing, for me anyway, is a process of learning and discovery, you know, of, of, as well as just of making. And, and so I've always thought that the, the boundary between fiction and reportage is a, is a fuzzy boundary. You know, it's not a, a, a hard and fast boundary. And one of the things I admire about, let's say writers like, for example, Charles Dickens, is the enormous breadth of their knowledge. The fact that they can represent so many different aspects of their, of their society, you know, um, not just the bits of the society that they happen to inhabit themselves, you know. Um, and, and I often say to, to students and to myself, actually, go find something out. You know, uh, don't assume that what you already know is enough. Go find something out. The world is full of interesting things. Go find, things, go find them out. You know, so, so I've always thought that, that there is a kind of discovery aspect to literature, mm -hmm. which I find increasingly interesting. I mean, like, you know, when I started out as a writer, I mean, like way back, like when I wrote Midnight's Children, I was a writer who had to plan everything very carefully. You know, I had to, wow. I had to have enormous architecture. 
know, <laughs> and, and until I had that, I wasn't able to start writing pages. Right. And, and nowadays, yes, of course, I still have architecture, I still have form, but I, I find myself leaving myself more and more spaces in which I can discover as I write, see what shows up, you know. And the way I tell myself what it is, is it's a change, if you like, from a, from a kind of form of symphonic composition to a kind of jazz. You know, and, um, leaving jazz, I mean, like the Indian rag, you know, of course there is a shape, but within that shape, there's a lot of room for discovery. You know? um, and, uh, and I find nowadays, that's the thing that appeals to me more. Interesting. Uh... Uh, to think about a reportage and your fiction, uh, because in some ways, I, um, well, maybe this is the same thing. I think of research in a lot of ways uh, mm. with regard to your past few novels. Yeah. Well, it's the same thing. You go research, yeah. I mean, re research into the contemporary. It, it, yeah. You know, yeah, research into the contemporary is journalism, you know. Mm. Um, but I, I, you know, I'm by training a historian. You know, that, that's, I, 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 yeah, I, didn't, yeah. I didn't study literature, I studied history. And, and I think that's had a very formative influence on me. You know, mm -hmm. the, 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 the historical method. How do you establish uh, what happened? What is the case and what did it mean? You know, um, I mean, I remember reading as, as a history student, reading a very interesting short essay, uh, a book called What is a Fact? Uh -huh. Um, and and what it one of the, one of the things things it tried to show is that this, the distinction between something that is merely an event and mm. something that is a fact. For instance, the River Rubicon. Lots of people crossed the Rubicon, <laughs> but those were just events. When right. Julius Caesar crossed the Rubicon, it's a historical fact because of the implications of that event. So, yeah. so it's that interesting thing about learning to distinguish. You know, the world is full of chaotic happenstance, but the art of but the art of the novel is a way of giving form and therefore meaning to, to bringing form and meaning out of that chaos, and that means that the study of history is very valuable because it teaches you how to do that. You know, and a lot of my novels have had historical content, whether it's recent history or ancient history. Um, but just the method of how you approach the real, you know, is something which I learned as a history student. It also seems to me like a philosophical question uh, and one that uh, is addressed in the essays uh, on Heraclitus or um, uh, uh, non-Western uh, philosophical traditions. Uh, mm. do you, do you, is that something that's you know, um, always been on your mind or a kind of newly? <laughs> no, no, I mean, Heraclitus, I mean, this question, the question of Heraclitus is, has really plagued me for a long time. You know, the one phrase of Heraclitus that everybody knows is the phrase that is usually abbreviated to character is destiny. You know, and, <laughs> and, and you could argue that the entire art of the novel arises from that phrase. That, um, you know, Captain Ahab's character is his destiny. His obsession with the whale leads to his destruction. Um, Othello's jealousy creates his story, creates his destiny. It's his fatal flaw, as Shakespearean scholars would say. Uh, the problem with character is destiny is that there's, especially in this world that we live in, in which we're which we as individuals are often feel out of control of events that are important in our lives, is that many things shape our destiny which have nothing to do with our character. You know? um, and, and so what do you do about that? What do you do about, as a novelist, what do you, how do you write about a world in which your, character, your character's character does not shape their destiny? You know? um, because you know, a, a bomb can shape their destiny. You know, a, 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 right. An economic collapse can shake the, shape their destiny. Uh, um, random accident can shape their destiny. You know? um, and so 
it's to me that question because I believe very much in that in, in, in allowing books to be driven by their characters. You know? But but you have to also understand that there's parts of people's lives, parts of all our lives, which our characters can't drive and don't drive. You know, and and um, how do you square that circle? You know, and uh, that that's been something I've thought about a lot. So. I- I have a question from the audience that speaks so beautifully to um, what you're saying. Uh, and it's a, it's a simple question, but I think it's really uh, central to um, the book of essays, which begins uh, with a kind of celebration of storytelling and um, what it means to us as children uh, and as a species and, you know, um, so the question is simply, uh, how can we keep the childhood imaginary alive into adulthood? Um, well, it's, something you've thought about a lot. Well, it's a great question. And I think people who love to read, I think, do this naturally. You know, I, I, the problem is how do we get more people to read? Um, and I, I worry sometimes that that may be getting harder. But, but um, as children, we have a, an extraordinary openness uh, to, to story. Um, we're willing to receive stories of almost any kind. Um, and as we grow older, we become more skeptical, you know, and, and we find ourselves saying things like, carpets don't fly. Right. <laughs> uh, which I would have thought everybody knows. In, including people who like to read books about in which carpets do fly. Um, but I think that that problem of our jaundiced adult self, you know, which prevents us uh, from opening our minds in certain ways, you know. Um, I mean, I don't, the answer is I don't know how you do it, but it, it's, but I would, I, I always try to encourage people to understand that that non-realistic fiction, fantasy, not just fantasy fiction, but surrealist fiction um, is not escapist. It's, it's, it's not a way of, of, of closing one's eyes to the truth. It's, it's, uh, it's in some ways a more beautiful way of expressing the truth. You know, um, I mean, Kafka's Metamorphosis at one level is about a man who turns into a bug. No. Um, but if if that was all it was, we we would not be talking about it and reading it. It's because it says something very dark and powerful about how human beings result to the arri- uh, react to the arrival in their lives of something strange and incomprehensible. You know? um, and 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 many of us have that experience that in in our lives in different ways that something in, intrudes into our lives, which is absolutely impossible for us to understand. And how we react to that, you know, is, is, uh, is a good story. And, and Kafka found a way of telling that story in a way that was surreal, surreal, you know. So, so I'm deeply in favor of, of um, encouraging people to see that the world is more than what can be perceived by walking out your front door. You know, it's the world is also something that we dream. And, and um, uh, the collision of that dream world with the actual, you know, is, is, is a very fruitful place for, for, for art. Yeah, it seems to me like one of, in a way, you know, the, the book is so, <laughs> ramifies in so many different directions, but it does seem like in some ways it's, it's really making an argument that um, uh, truth is stranger than fiction. Yeah. Right. Uh, and, and that fiction can't even hope, as outlandish as it may try to be, to capture the um, insanity. Of, no, I mean, I, there's a, a person I quoted in somewhere in the book, when I was first yeah. in, on my very first visits to Latin America, where yeah. I was talking, I mean, to the right. proverbial taxi driver uh, uh, about, about Garcia Marquez. And, and he said, oh, you know, this stuff happens all the time. Garcia Marquez, he's just a good typist. <laughs> yeah. In other words, that 
I heard that so many times about magic realism in Latin America that, that this is real. You know, the, 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 this is a description of the world in which we live. Um, and I must say, I've had the same experience myself with, for instance, with Midnight's Children. I remember when it came out, it was greeted in the, in the West largely as a work of, of, of fantasy fiction. And it was greeted in South Asia, in India and Pakistan, almost as a history book. Uh, uh, I remember a young journalist coming up to me when I went there on a book tour just after the book came out. This young journalist coming up to me, he said, he said, you know, I could have written your book. I know all that stuff. And I, I decided to take that as a compliment because he was saying that the books in some way expressed a shared experience, you know, even though in its manner, it's, it's highly fabulous, you know, so. Yeah. And at the same time, it seems to me like uh, a lot of your work uh, tells the story of uh, someone who's living in it ordinary slash extraordinary reality, like a reality that's just indescribably, you know, ordinary, but also strange and special, who gets thrust into an, uh, a kind of notoriety or uh, they, they become famous or foregrounded uh, historically. I, you know, Does that makes sense, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think what happens is you want to put mm. your characters into a situation which questions them, you know, um, where, where they have to ask themselves profound questions about themselves. So, you know, for instance, in the, in the last novel in, in Kishat, you have a kind of ordinary man, you know, he's a, he's a commercial salesman. Um, but because of his obsessions with television, um, he decides to cross the country on an impossible quest of love, you know, and yet he never once doubts that he can do it. You know? um, and so he's putting himself in an impossible situation, a situation in which the risks of failure, of humiliation, of heartbreak, you know, are, are all very great. And yet he's willing to take that risk because of some kind of belief about what the world is like. You know, and and uh, and so his belief of that belief, he he believes the world is a. The world is constantly telling him that it's not a, and yet he clings to it. And that's both, to my view, that's both his comedy and his tragedy. Mm -hmm. um, that collision uh, between his idea of the world and what the world is telling him that it is. You know? So one. Um... One just last part of the book that I'd love to hear you talk about uh, in the precious time I have with you is this question of um, ordinariness and then extraordinariness as it relates to like fame, right? So there are all these great stories in the essays about finding yourself at dinner with a political figure or, um, you know, um, Hollywood celebrity or, you know, this or that person. And, you know, I think in some ways that that, um, those stories are a little bit like your fiction writ small or, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Well, I mean, in those stories, I'm usually the everyman figure. <laughs> yes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, mean, I, find, the myself, nice man. Yeah. I find myself in rooms that, that, you know, one doesn't normally expect to find oneself in, you know, and, I, and, and, and how, do you, how do you deal with that? You know, I, I, when I was writing The Jaguar Smile, when I was in, traveling in Nicaragua in the, in, during the Contra War in the mid-80s, I found myself invited to a dinner with most of the Sandinista directorate, you know, with uh, maybe six of the nine members of the directorate in the house of the appalling Daniel Ortega, you know, and, and I thought, how do I deal with this? Because I thought if I put a tape recorder on the table, it's going to completely change the conversation. People will talk to the tape recorder, you know, even though they knew I was there to write. So they knew that this was not off. I wasn't pretending that this was off the record, but I thought that the, the fact of the tape recorder 
changes the way people talk. And, and, and yet I wanted to have a record of the conversation. So what I did was I invented a stomach upset. <laughs> it's in the book, right? I remember yeah. that. Yeah. Like every 10 minutes or so, I said, excuse me, I just have to go. <laughs> After I crazily write um, right. what I'd heard and come back and then quarter of an hour later, I'd say, look, I'm really embarrassed. I'm sorry, I have to go to the bathroom. And, and I came away with some kind of record of the event. So that was one way of dealing with being in the presence of, of, of significant historical players, you know. So it's like uh, the the anecdotes in the um, book of essays add up to kind of a Dickensian um, oh, good. kind of life story, right? Oh, good. Well, you know, I've been around, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the time, I don't want to hog all of, uh, all of your time, so I'll, I'll ask you a few questions from the audience uh, mm -hmm. before we close. Uh, I'll be... Um, there's, there are many, but I'll be selective and ask you, um, well, here's one. How do you think about a writer's obligate, obligation as a citizen? Well, I've thought about this many times. A writer's yeah. obligated to promote a certain kind of truth, whether it is lit, religious or political. Well, I, I kind of, in a way, it's, I mean, it's a good question, but I, I would separate being a writer from being a citizen. I think there, there are activities that one may undertake as a citizen, which require something more immediate uh, than the writing of a novel, which can take, you know, in my case, has often taken me five years. Um, you, you can't, in a way, take up social issues, political issues in, in something that takes you five years to write, because the world changes very fast. So, so there's, the, there's a thing that I have sometimes done, which is, which is to write in another vein, in a more direct vein, um, when there are uh, social issues or political issues that I want to engage with. Um, when I'm working as a creative writer, I'm, I'm, I'm really the servant of the book. You know, that's, that's, that's my only responsibility. And, and also, I want to write books that will, if I'm lucky, endure, you know, so I, so I don't want them to be uh, too uh, ephemerally tied to this or that issue, you know, so um, I want, I mean, I, one of the things I take great pride in is that Midnight's Children just celebrated its 40th anniversary this year, and, and there are still people for whom it's relevant, you know, the fact is, it's at least past jump the hurdle of one generation, you know, and, and that's what you want to happen. You want your books to be around when you're not. And so for me, the responsibility to the work as an artist is one thing and social responsibility is another thing which you may well undertake through direct action. Like you mentioned my involvement in, in Pen America or, or in, in journalistic work, etc. So I, I just make that separation. Well, uh, I should tell you that when I was studying for my orals exams for my PhD in English lit, uh, Midnight's Children was on the oh. reading list. So, so you're um, momentarily immortal. Uh, <laughs> but uh, um, that kind of, I mean, obliquely leads to another audience question. Um, I mean, you've been talking about writing essentially is a solitary enterprise, but now you've written a play. Mm -hmm. uh, and oh, an audience question here is, have you ever considered or discussed collaborating with other writers or artists? Another way of thinking about that is just like the solitary nature of uh, your creative enterprise. Um, yeah, I mean, I the answer is yes, I have a number of times collaborated with visual artists. You know, I've, I've, I've made um, uh, a book with the artist Francesco Clemente, where, where with text by me and, and illustration and images by him. Um, I actually, the Indian writer, Bhupen Kaka, painter Bhupen Kaka, I've collaborated with a number of ways. First, in a long time ago, he took two of my short stories and made uh, woodcuts and nylon cuts from them. Um, but also at one point, he painted my portrait and, and that I'm happy to say, is now the only 
painting by an Indian artist, which is in the British National Portrait Gallery. Um, so with the visual arts, I have, uh, and actually, you know, I wrote, a, I wrote the lyrics for a song by you too. So there's that too. Um, so I have sometimes collaborated and, I'm, and actually I'm very much enjoying uh, in these early stages of, of working on the, on the production of this play. And I'm really enjoying the, the collaboration with the director and the producer. So yeah, it makes a change, you know? I mean, I, I do, as I say, by nature, I think I'm more the solitary kind, but, but it makes a, very, makes a very good change to, to collaborate. I mean, for example, I, I mean, I've written the screenplay for at least one movie and that was, that was an interesting collaboration. Uh, well, uh, I, uh, I would recommend, I looked up the portrait uh, of you by Bhupan Karkar uh, when I read the essay and it's it, amazing. It's, it's very beautiful picture. It is. Uh, and it doesn't really look like me, but it's good. <laughs> <laughs> it's more two-dimensional, but otherwise it's pretty good. <laughs> well, thank you, Salvan, for your time and, uh, you know, for your work. Uh, we can't wait to um, hear more about this play. I hope it travels around the world. Uh, me too. To, me too. To Troy and, um, you know, um, Greece and everywhere in between. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Are you are you writing any fiction at all as well? Yes, I mean I've started a novel, but but, but I'm, I mean I've got about seventy five pages of what will probably be three hundred and seventy five pages. So so there's a long way to go yet, and it's a historical novel. I'll say that. Great. Oh, I won't I won't press any further, um, and uh, well I'll just. Um, you know, uh, end by kind of urging people to check out Languages of Truth uh, by Salman Rushdie. It's an amazing uh, work that covers everything uh, from um, contemporary political history to um, literary history, in India, Persia, uh, Europe, and beyond. Uh, and also is full of just amazing stories. I love the stories about Carrie Fisher and um, Chris Christopher Hitchens and uh, many others. So I hope many people will read this book. Um, and I guess we have a, a just a, you know, I don't know, 45 seconds hmm. left to go. Um, do you want to uh, tell us about your Marvel uh, comic books I see over there in the... Over there? Yeah. This is because, you know, I've been trying to catch up with the modern world. And so, <laughs> so I found myself trying to watch some of the, 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 the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Um, and I've managed to watch like the last three. And then I watched WandaVision, which I really liked. Oh, good. Good. What did you think about it? Have you seen the, the Loki or I've seen episode other one. films? I've seen episode oh, one. Looks pretty good so far. Yeah. Um, my daughter is a big fan. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, well, I, I'll let you get back to your Netflix viewing. Salman, it's such a pleasure to meet you and speak with you. Thank you very much. And congratulations on publication of the book. Thanks. Thanks so much. Bye, everybody.